Let's get started with the second half. This play right here, we got a little bit lucky on. This was almost a pick six going the other direction. Uh, let's talk about what's going on. There's a little bit of a pin and pull going on here on the front side. You're going to see these down blocks, and you're going to see the center and the guard are going to get out, get out and pull around. That has counter elements to it. Nobody's getting kicked out, but we are pinning down and pulling around. And then you're going to see these backside guys are going to run to cut off. So it's an inside, like, run play. When I mean inside, I mean it's a run play happening inside the box here. And he's trying to pin everybody down. Sorry. They're trying to pin down and then they're trying to get around that edge right there. And then over here on the front side, you have hitches. So everybody's running these walk-off hitches. Uh, and Keaton is looking at this key defender here. I'm going to clear everything real quick. He's looking at this guy as he puts the ball and he seats it at the running back. He's going to see, does this person commit to the run? Which, as you can see right here, that's his reading his key. So his key is committed to the run. And if you go back to the pre-snap look, here's a safety from depth that's going to come down. So if I know I got hitches, usually this safety from depth, all I got to do is decide, can I beat him to the point? So the two keys, let me clear it again. The two keys are going to be this backer. Does he commit to the run? Does this safety, is he coming from depth? So that's why you wonder, why is Keaton pulling the ball here and throwing this? Because we all see from up top, this guy's jumping the heck out of it. But now let me go back to vision. Because we are cutting off here on the back side, we are leaving a defender free right here. And this guy can be in your vision. So what I think is happening here is if you look at Keaton's vision, he knew pre-snap that this guy was coming from depth. But what I don't think he has full vision on is just how fast that guy is jumping it. Because if you watch as he throws the ball, there is no like slightly pulling it back. There is no like, oh my gosh. When a quarterback has a moment like that where all of a sudden right as they're throwing it, they see somebody jumping it, you'll see their arm change a little bit and they'll say, oh my gosh, they're trying to pull the ball back from throwing it. But right here, I don't think he realized it until he gets vision on the guy because of this player that's in his vision, blocking it. So he's going off of keys, which back to his two keys, that guy committing, that guy coming from depth and saying, here's this space. I can beat this player to that space. But defensive player jumps the absolute heck out of it, and BYU gets a little bit lucky that it's not another pick six right there. All right, I know it's tough to have to relive these things sometimes. Um, this is the pick six. We won't watch the whole thing. Obviously, we know what happens after that. I'm just going to talk about the play. This is basically a dash out. And what that means is the quarterback is going to be looking up top because do I have a gimme? So an example would be, and I'm not saying that that's happening specifically here, but I'm going to give you a bunch of variations. You can have a hitch. You can have a quick out. You can have something quick game over here that the quarterback is going to look at and he's going to be able to identify, can I take that right now? If he can, he takes it. If he can't, he's going to run out here to the front side. Okay, so what the offense is trying to do is they're going to try to pin this front side here to allow the quarterback to get out on the edge. And then over here, the routes, you're basically going to get these two stop routes um, at about 14 to 15 yards, depending on kind of like, I mean, it's not necessarily built by down and distance, but you'd probably say somewhere between 14 to 16 yards. Obviously, you can see the outside one is going to go deeper than the inside one. I just kind of want to talk about the matchup here and why I believe Keaton felt confident in taking this because guys do this all the time. Look at the size differential here between Isaac and this player that's on him. So you're essentially going to say, I can body him up. I can see that he's in front of him. There's nothing that's here that's going to make me say no to the throw. And so I'm going to make this throw because essentially for this guy to stop this, he has to run through my guy. Pass interference. So you take the throw. So the decision for the throw is totally fine. Like the ball is a little bit on his inside, but I believe it looks worse. I know this is super blurry, but what you can't see here is that the defender actually hits and makes body contact with Isaac that then makes his body almost get lunged slightly forward. If you can see where the ball is hitting him, the ball is actually hitting his hand behind his face mask, behind his even, even behind his chest. The natural body movement of a player is that as he reacts to the ball, he is going to take his chest, he's going to take his chin and chest to that ball. The fact that his chin and chest are moving forward away from the ball tells you that there was impact made 
behind him. And I know we've all seen the, 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 the clip where the defender's arms are draped around him. Yes, that is part of it. But also, it's, it's the impact that his body makes on Isaac before the ball gets there to not allow Isaac to make the proper movement to the ball. So that's why this was a key element to me in what I believe should have been called a pass interference. And then obviously, it's just unfortunate that it turns into a pick six. But I just wanted to talk about the decision. To me, this is totally fine to make this decision. You have a very big bodied guy that is in front of, like when you see Keaton making this decision, here's your big target with somebody coming from behind him. That is a totally fine to make that decision. That impact right there is what's not accounted for and what doesn't get called. All right, this is the drive coming out of the turnover for a touchdown. I just kind of want to highlight just how big of a throw this was, not only in the game, but also the movement that Keaton makes here and where he throws the ball. So this concept, it's just a double go concept. We just got go balls on the outside. This inside receiver is going to read the middle of the field and he's going to snap off on a basic. You have seven man protection, which means your five down linemen are going to be blocking. And then you're going to get your backs that are going to step up and chip off the edges and most likely go to the flats. But the big thing here is the movement. So Keaton's going to have his eyes down the middle. He recognizes it's a single safety middle. He's going to take one of the go balls to move up and to your left, and then to throw a ball from the left hash all the way down to the 30 and drops it in the bucket. That is a big time throw, 50 yards just in terms of like vertical distance, not including the diagonal uh, range of the throw there. And I'm not gonna get into breaking down exactly how far it is, but not very often do you see a quarterback slide left right here, climb up and left, and then send the ball down to the other go ball. And this is not bad coverage by this guy. This is just absolutely dropping it in the bucket. Great throw, great catch. The thing I like also is in the game, right? This is a, a, a game you just turned the ball over for the second time you handed them seven points, right? That can be frustrating. That can be just you like so sick inside of like, man, what, like, we got to get back into this. We can't just be handing them things. And so to come out and make a statement play like this, I, I just love when offenses do that. When despite what's not going well, despite what hasn't gone in your favor, despite your mistakes that have hurt your own team, you come back and you step up and you make another play. I love that resilient nature um, to the players that they demonstrated here. And I just think that this was a big, big play in the game basically jumping and clawing right back into it quickly. All right, this play down here in the red zone doesn't have any real significance on the drive or in the game. But to me, I'm putting it up here because it has significance in how our scheme is viewed in terms of personnel. So we're in a two tight end set. You can see our two tight ends right here. We're going to motion across. That's going to put four to this side. So it's not uncommon to see a type of push you're going to see right here or a trace by a safety, they're essentially in, this is the corner, safety, safety, corner. If they're playing a true quarters look right here, which means four across, you can get a four trace look, which means this guy is gonna push and get eyes towards that side of the field, looking up any crosser, okay? So they go into a little bit of a four trace here, but I want you to notice how many eyes are aware of flow coming this way, especially because of our personnel. So here you have Isaac Rex that's coming front side. In terms, or sorry, that's coming back towards the back side. In terms of how many guys that we have on the front side of this play, starting out with four, imagine if we had sent these players out into the flat. These guys are ill-equipped of their positioning because they're primarily focused on one of our key players and the potential of him coming back across the formation, right? Now, what this does is this opens up opportunities for other players, but you can see right here, we try to use an opportunity to flow on the backside because what does BYU show? BYU shows sprint out. Okay, this is great. We'll show sprint out. We'll have a crosser. We'll have somebody to the front side. We'll take our eyes to this side of the field in hopes that the defense pursues what they've seen a number of times for us. And then let's try to slip Isaac out the other way. This little throwback scheme can be a really, really good scheme. But again, the reason I'm putting this on there, watch how aware every single one of these players are when Isaac runs to the other side. Look at these hands come out. There he is, there he is, there he is. 
And when you can see as the ball is thrown, this team is very aware of this. Now, some may ask when we're doing this, well, then why did he throw the ball back there? If you notice, this is a designed throwback play. Tell me if anybody else is planning on the ball coming. This is a post back here. No, it is a designed throwback. So this is a him or a throwaway. Now, he's given him a chance and it's close, but these are these type of throwback throws. I just, again, I'm making mention of it because this is going to work for us as well. If you notice the attention that Isaac is getting right now and the amount of players that are drawing towards him, that is going to open up opportunities and situations also for other players because of the attention. That I All right, this is that mesh concept that you've seen utilized a number of times in this game. But I want to put this up not only because of the game, but I also because of the different positions that you'll see Isaac moved around in this. Earlier in the game, you saw him getting a ball on the backside of the mesh. So what that means is here the mesh is starting from this side. Isaac's coming underneath the mesh. This is the OTB, which means over the ball, and this is the rail. So earlier in the game, you saw Isaac catching this ball over here. Well, now you're going to be see Isaac used as coming underneath the mesh. And so here, here comes your rail route. This is where eyes will go first. We know we're getting man coverage as they're running with man. It's covered well. This is why mesh is so good because now you have one player setting the mesh, another player coming underneath the mesh, and the guy coming underneath the mesh is the one that usually his player has to adjust running around this kind of chaos right there. And so he's number two in the progression. But the thing that I like is the design, right? Isaac is being moved around in so many different places on this mesh. He'll catch some in the first half as the backside of the mesh, which is this guy, the guy that set it. And now he's catching it as coming underneath the mesh. And in man coverage, when you get this natural little rub right here, and this guy settles thinking it's being passed off, now he's basically uncovered. That's the defender that's supposed to be running with him. That type of space in man coverage is what allows Isaac to catch the ball and run upfield like this. All right, I know this was tough right here. We get in second and goal after a big play and we take a sack, right? I want to talk about what was going on conceptually and why this happened. What we have here is we have a go. You're going to get a choice route over here. Over here, you're going to have a stick, an inside fade. Some people call it a box fade or a slot fade and another hitch. So if you get man press and you want to take this inside fade, you can take it. If you get zone and you feel like there is leverage on one of these inside guys, the choice of the stick, you can take it. Ideally, if you believe you have a great choice runner and you can keep this next defender inside at bay for space, he can win in or out. Because what you're doing is you're gonna clear out this corner. So he's out of there. If you can keep him at bay, you've essentially given yourself this area of the field to try to win against one defender. So the choice route here to the boundary is really nice. And I can see why Keaton chose it. To the front side, the only other reason why you would come up there is if this player is soft and you know that you can rip a five-yard hitch really quick, you can take it. Or if for some reason they bring pressure and now this defender has to push to guard your stick route, you could throw into the pressure if you wanted. So I think it's a good decision. He comes down to the choice player. With him slightly inside right there, he's most likely going to try to put a move and break out to win. And I don't know if we have enough time to win there, right? This sneaks through. Keaton's got to take off. I don't know if he would have had a little bit longer. Would we have been able to throw this ball potentially down here in the red zone? These little tight looks, you still got to throw them, right? This is what made Drew Brees great. Drew Brees would get these looks right here and his guy would only have about a step and a half on somebody. Drew would be able to put the ball right on the offset a yard in, or a foot in front of the numbers in front of his guy his guy catches it and gets up filled the downside here is we don't get to see the choice play out because we have a leak in protection right here because of the leak in protection Keaton tries to go to the side of his decision what that means is my eyes were front side so I was deciding front side so now he takes off to the side of his decision where his eyes are at and he's unable to get away from it. So it's tough because we just moved down the field. We take a sack. We're probably going to what I would say is the right spot to go. And if this is shored up right here in protection, and he says no to that, most likely either Keaton's going to fill this safe space, take off here now to a three receiver side, or try to get whatever yards that he can. All right, we take another go ball shot here. 
Another great ball, dropping it in the bucket. You know, so far in this game, BYU has hit some shot plays, which is great. I want to just kind of highlight the difference here. You get them in this little stack look, tight ends off the ball. This is a little bit more of a unique look than what BYU usually does some of their mirrored routes out of. But it's great here. It gives them a stack look. And with this stack alignment up top, you're going to get a little bit of, watch this. To me, this isn't stack opposite. Stack opposite mean with this guy's lined up head over him. They're playing true man. So this player is going to be on him. This player is going to be going on him. So as they separate right there, and as he goes outside, from inside, this player is probably going to be taking a little bit of a flatter angle, which as you can see, do you see how he starts flat right there? That little bit of flat, and he's just shuffling his feet. He's waiting for some type of break. An example would be a team that runs a little swap release out, and then he's going to come inside and settle, or they'll go swap release out. He'll go inside, push up, and run a high corner. There's all these different variations, but this defender is absolutely planning on some type of break, and then so you swap release, and look at him. He's waiting for the break. Still, there's no break. We just run by him. So this was a nice design, giving a little bit different look than how BYU has taken some of their go ball shots. I think Keaton does a great job of seeing it, delivering it on time, and they make it look easy. This is a big play, again, back-to-back -back drives, another big shot, and they're making it look easy. I think these were some of the things that, despite the loss, I think there's some things that you can look at and say, okay, that's great that this showed up in the game for BYU. And I'm going to just say it's these big plays. BYU is able to find some big plays up over the top in the pass game. And going forward in this season, they're absolutely going to need to continue to find those. All right, fourth and seven. This is the other interception. I know this one, when you lose what's happening in the picture, it looks like, man, what is going on between the receiver and the quarterback? So let's break down to talk about what's happening and why the decision was made. They're in man coverage here, right? They're going to be locked up in man coverage. We're going to rotate down man coverage across the board. So they're in a robber. See this player right here? This is the robber player. And then now that's on the running back. He's on the tight end. Locked up, locked up, locked up. So you recognize man coverage. You're going to work one of the outside guys in this scheme. They're getting vertically off the ball. Now, I'm not sure if it was a play where there was a conversion, which would mean depending on what the route was versus press, you would convert to a go. But we've seen BYU take these back shoulder shots before. Now, what you can't see right here is when the DB turns, he is turning his back to our receiver. So when Keaton decides to throw this ball, they are almost even, close to even, but he has the back of the defender's head. So it is a very common teaching thing that when you have the back of the defender's head and your receiver may not outrun him because of matchup, you throw the ball back shoulder, back behind that player's head. So he's throwing a ball, like the ball right now, this is a totally fine decision. If you can see what's happening on the, like beyond the screen, he is throwing a ball that I've seen BYU quarterbacks make. I've seen millions of quarterbacks make to make this throw back shoulder. But what's happening is right now, this DB all of a sudden gets his eyes around and now he has eyes on the ball. So this could be for a variety of reasons. One, BYU has a history over the last few years of being exceptional at these back shoulder throws. Two, in the first couple of games, BYU made a lot of attempts in man coverage with defenders back of the heads to the quarterback. They made a lot of attempts at these type of throws. They didn't complete them, but they were continuing to make those attempts. So it would not have surprised me at all if in practice, if these defensive backs were practicing on getting their eyes around on back shoulder throws. And so here, this DB was well prepared. He gets his eyes around. Now, Coaching up the wide receivers. I know that in this situation, we're saying, how come the receiver is not making an attempt at the ball? Yes, for whatever reason, his eyes didn't get there quick enough to see where the ball is at. You can tell right here, he's lost the ball and he's unaware that this ball is coming to him. He hasn't found the ball, but the defensive back has found the ball. So yes, this does look like a, what the heck is going on in this situation? I've experienced this same situation just like many other quarterbacks have experienced it. When you make the decision to throw the ball, right here, it is not a wrong decision. But once the ball comes out of your hands, now there is so many things out of your control that the defender does and that your guy has to do. And so unfortunately, this is one of those situations where 
Our guy doesn't have eyes on the ball. Their guy makes a good play and gets eyes on the ball. And it looks like we just threw a ball up for grabs, but that is not the case at all. This was an attempted back shoulder throw that once the ball left Keaton's hands, things happened, unfortunately, to work against us. All right, here we go. Third and nine. Big play in the game. BYU needs a drive here to score some points. They get the completion. I want to talk about the concept. And as you can see, the ball is tipped here. We're very lucky that it went to still where Keaton was planning. But what you're going to get here is you're going to get a dagger concept. Okay, so what dagger concept are? Is there a seam? If it's middle open, he'll take the middle. And then it'll be an in cut on the outside. The reason why I'm not drawing these parts is because what our team does to swap release a dagger concept. The other thing they're doing is they're going to chip and release Isaac out here to the flat. So what you're getting, the reason for a seam is because you are trying to take the top coverage, the, the, the coverage over the top, you are trying to run them off. You are trying to basically expand. If this is the shell of the coverage and these are the safeties, you are trying to expand them with depth. You want them moving backwards. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to create a in cut and a flat. You see this high low space that's happening here? So you're going to influence a key defender, and then you are going to try to play a high low off of him. But what BYU does here is they swap release it. So they're going to take the outside receiver right here, and he is going to be responsible for this route that's going to essentially run through the over-the-top coverage. And then you're going to get this receiver that is going to actually widen, and he is going to be responsible for that in cut. So when you draw it up, it's going to look like this, a swap release a dagger concept, still Isaac out into the flat. So that's what we get right here. You can see them start to go. You can see the swap release. There that happens. As they push up, you can see here comes Isaac into the flat. So behind him, this is where that in cut is coming in. And that's what Keaton sees. Keaton sees right here, these defenders, these defenders were influenced by Isaac. And then we were able to get that widened in cut. Sometimes when they swap release a dagger, you can say that it becomes a widened dagger or a wide and in cut because if i were to take this player out of it this player is going to widen out here by the numbers and then run his in cut so it's a widen dagger so that is how he gets up into this same space by the hash and now how we got lucky you can see that this ball as keaton slides left they get a hand on it tipped balls rarely go to where you're throwing this one does on the defensive side of the ball, you always hear tips and overthrows, tips and overthrows. That's how they want to create interceptions. A tipped ball or an overthrown ball gives them an opportunity for an interception. So we are very fortunate here that this tipped ball actually went exactly to where Keaton's throwing it on this swap release dagger, and we pick up some extra yards. Okay, here we go. Another third down. BYU's trying to claw back into this game. It's empty. They motion over. This is that mesh concept that you've seen them use a lot throughout this game. It's just another variation of it. But Keaton's able to scramble and find somebody completely outside of the concept. So here, again, the mesh concept, but coming from some very unique situation, or an empty set. You didn't see that um, during the other parts of the game. So again, BYU is using a concept that they have a lot of confidence with, but they're doing it out of a little variation of formation. So again, that means rail. We're going to set the mesh. We're going to come under the mesh, and we're going to get an OTB. Keaton's going to start his eyes at the rail. You see him. Now he comes to the mesh. The mesh is happening right here. Here you can see Isaac is on top of the mesh. Last time that I showed this, he was below the mesh. He's on top of it. Keaton's got to get out of there. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. You see all of the players that are going to be involved in the mesh. You see the motion that is the rail. You see the OTB. You see the player that's going to set the mesh. You see the player that's going to come underneath the mesh. What you don't see is the player up at the top of the screen that is going to be the person that Keaton ends up hitting on this run back. So here's the whole mesh play concept going through. He abandons the pocket and then again makes another nice throw. Keaton did this a number of times in the game, getting outside of the pocket and making these throws to the sideline deep downfield. That is a big pickup right here on a critical third and three that gets us all the way down onto or inside the 40-yard line. All right, first and 10, BYU goes to their wide cross concept. Finds Isaac right here for a really solid play to get us inside the red zone. I want to talk about what they bring here. As you can see, they're going to play in a single hide coverage. It's going to be cover three. You can't see the corner down here. But they're going to bring this wheel backer right here. When they bring the wheel, that leaves them three deep, three under. So now you have three underneath players. But what they do here is 
They'll push through. They're going to push through, push through. So that means Y cross is such a great concept because here it's going to put this player in a bind with the back. Now, we don't get the back out. That's an issue. The reason we can't get the back out is because in protection, our offensive line is working in this direction here. And then so if the will comes, that's who the back is responsible for. So the will comes, the back has to pick him up. If the will did not come, the back is going to be out into the flat here. So he picks him up. We could be in a little bit of a bind here because there is no influence on this player. He could sink for depth underneath the Y, but he doesn't. He feels the cut of the running back and for whatever reason, steps up. I don't feel like this was an add-on because by no means does he add on. It almost looks to me like he knows the back is going to be out into the flat if he comes out. He's chewed up in protection, so I'm just going to squeeze him. It's kind of a unique thing to do because some coverages, they'll say it's three deep, three under. So I'm sinking to my area, sinking to my area, sinking to my area. Okay, the back doesn't come out into the flat. I know I have nobody in the flat. So that means I don't have to push there. So that means I can push, this would be this guy, I can push with a little more depth. Meaning he could almost push right here. Oh, he's in protection. I'm going to sink and I'm going to look up to see, is there anybody crossing? That's what a really skilled guy would do there. Again, backing up, recognizing they have no player that can get out into this flat. So I am not just going to go running there. I am going to sink and add to where I can help. And so to me, this is where this guy messed up and we capitalize and we hit our white cross. Really, really big play. Again, 10 minutes left in the game. We're getting into the red zone. You score here. It, you know, it could be a one, one score game. So really big play here on this first and 10. Again, backing up. I like when I see BYU be aggressive on first downs and pick up these first down throws on first down. Okay, I'm going back on this one because I believe that this was the one where we got penalized um, after this play for uh, illegal touching. And basically what it is is here you can see that Isaac is on the line of scrimmage and you can see we have a receiver outside of him on the same side that's also on the line of scrimmage. Because he is on the line of scrimmage, he is ineligible to catch a pass. If Isaac is on to this side, both players need to be off for all of them to be eligible and Isaac to be eligible to catch a pass. In this case right here, Isaac is ineligible, he's eligible, and he is eligible. In run sets, you can put anybody you want on because you're going to be running the football, so it doesn't matter if somebody's covered up. But this is the term covered up. Isaac is being covered up by this player. Now, he could catch a pass. He could catch a pass. He could catch a pass, and so could our receiver down here. The only guy in this formation that cannot catch a pass is Isaac. And again, this has bitten us uh, a number of times in these games of illegal touching. That is why this play was penalized and brought back. Okay, it's second and 10. BYU come back, comes back to their mesh concept here close to the red zone and gets a really big game. They've had a couple of these this day where they got really big gains out of this mesh concept. I know I've talked about it before, but just to go over again, you're going to get somebody that's going to set the mesh. You're going to get a rail route. You're going to get somebody that's going to be an over the ball, and you're going to get someone coming underneath. In man coverage, when that player tries to run with the underneath guy, if you can make him move or get a subtle little rub right here, this movement that he has to make to avoid his own defender, his teammate, that little move right there slows him up. Our guy gets to stay on the run, and it's easy. Keaton just looks to the rail, says yes or no, comes underneath, give our guy the ball, and now he gets to turn up field for a good gain down here, get us inside. Again, this mesh concept showed up really, really well for us throughout the game in a variety of situations. There were times it was zone, and we threw to the backside of the mesh. There were times that it was man, and we hit the underneath guy that went for good yards, and then we had the scramble. We were able to run uh, in empty and get to the backside comeback. BYU used meshed a number of times in the game and it worked really well for him. All right, we're going to end with a good one right here. End on a positive. Touchdown run right here where we get to walk in untouched. Really good job here executing. Our offensive line is going to sell away from the jet sweep. They're going to sell this zone action right here. In some cases, the quarterback is making a read at the line of scrimmage. Okay, Sometimes I it, like it's a numbers count. Sometimes it's a leverage count. But basically what you're doing is you're looking at edge defenders and backers. 
and it's all based off of a count. And so because of the count and the spacing, you can either give the jet sweep or you can give this zone action that you're seeing right here. So based off of the count and numbers, we give the jet sweep right here. You can notice the unblocked defender is here. Wideout is going to push crack on that defender. And then he's going to get up and he's going to block the corner. You can see because of run keys, watch how these linebackers are influenced as our offensive line moves in this direction. Because some people may say, why is the O-linemen, why are they moving opposite of the run? Well, because these backers have run fits, which means as the gaps move, as these linemen run, as they move, gaps move with them, they have responsibilities in those specific gaps. So their run keys move, they move with the gaps. You see that? They move with the gaps, they move with the gaps. You have players moving with the gaps. Yes, you have people with vision in the backfield that see that the jet sweep was handed off, but these backers are absolutely influenced by the movement of the offensive line and how they move the run gaps and how as those run gaps move, if they have their eyes on their keys, they will be moved and influenced as well. And that's what happens. And that's why it's easy. It's just basically two on two. We block them up and we walk in for the touchdown.